Father God, thank you very much for drawing us together. And thank you for the sweetness of fellowship that we have as a church family. I know there's many who are distant from us this morning. But I know that you can connect us in the spirit. And I pray that that would be the case through our prayers, through you filling our hearts with worship, through you drawing us into the word. I also pray, too, that those connecting with us remotely uh, would be able to really engage as well. I know that things are strange right now as, as we, there's kind of an enforced distance because of uh, the virus precautions. But, Father, I pray that you would overcome all of that to draw us into worship with you, and, or worship of you, and that we would learn from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's prepare now to uh, worship together in song. Wish you all a good morning and, and to uh, come with us this morning in a time of worship and fellowship. And we will begin with uh, a few worship songs and singing and celebration to lift our hearts up and get us uh, pumped up and going this morning. It's cold outside, but uh, we're going to warm things up within our hearts with a few songs this morning. We're going to start off with Down at the Cross.
Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross, rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Oh, that old song, The Old Rugged Cross. When the music fades, all is stripped away, 
and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your much deeper within though the waves may appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all
we do come this morning and we ask you to search us out, to look into our hearts. Where are we today? Are we looking to that old rugged cross? Are we kneeling down before it? Are we coming for your mercy and your forgiveness? Father, I know there are things that uh, we do and sometimes we say and the way we act that are not as pleasing and, and the way you would have us to be personally for you. Search us out, Lord. Help us become more like you. Help us to kneel before the cross and ask for your forgiveness and your mercy and the love and the blood that you gave that day on Calvary's Hill for our sin. Father, we thank you, we love you, and we just give you all the praise and glory this morning. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen. Lord, as we get into your word this morning, I pray that you would teach us very clearly what you want us to know. What do we need to hear from the scriptures? I pray that we would come to understand your word better, that we would love you more, and that we would learn how to live rightly and effectively in this world that you have placed us in. At this moment in time, you said in the scriptures that, uh, that you have appointed where a person lives and when they live and who they are around. So this is our time, Lord. I pray that you would help us to use this time well. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to tell you a story about a lady named Cynthia, okay? This is a fictitious story. I'll just, a uh, little disclaimer up front, but just to kind of paint this picture. So uh, Cynthia, she is about a month out from her wedding. And she is very, very excited about this. She and her fiancé are excited to get married. And they are um, looking forward to that day. They've planned it all out. And she has a beautiful wedding dress that she's picked out. But she also realizes that she cannot put on any weight at all or she is not going to fit into this wedding dress anymore. And so she is being very diligent with her diet, with her exercise. The problem is, is about two weeks before her wedding, is her best friend is getting married. And she knows that she is going to be going to this wedding reception, and there is going to be all this wonderful food. And so she is having to decide ahead of time, okay, I know what they're eating, and I know that I need to stick with the salad, this small portion, and this minuscule slice of wedding cake. That is all that I, all that I can have. And so she has made this decision, and she heads into that day, and she's excited. I mean, she's, she's one of the bridesmaids, and uh, so she's uh, excited to be a part of this. And then she gets to the wedding reception, and she didn't realize this was not a buffet wedding reception, but this was the kind where they are going to set the food right in front of you. And because she's part of the wedding party, she's at the head table. And so she's like, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? You know, because the food's all going to be there, and they're not giving out little slices of wedding cake. They're giving out these full, big old slices of wedding cake. And so she is then faced with a choice. What am I going to do when this is presented before me? Because I've got a goal in mind. Two weeks from now, I've got to fit into that wedding dress. I've got to look good for my husband. I'm going to be in front of all these people. I have a goal. I have something in the future that's important to me, and I can't let the present temptations compromise that. Okay, now that's, again, it's just a story that, that I made up, but to illustrate the principle that there are decisions that we face today that are going to have consequences in the future. And we have to have the conviction before we face the crisis. How are we going to handle it when the time comes? Cynthia knew, I'm heading into this, there's going to be temptations. So she had to make the decision ahead of time how she was going to handle those when she reached that point. What we're going to look at today is uh, the story in the book of Daniel. We're going to go to Daniel chapter 1. You can begin turning there in your Bibles. And this is, we're going to start into a series on the book of Daniel. We're going to probably do at least the first six chapters. I don't know if we'll get into the last bit of it. But the first part of the book of Daniel talks an awful lot about how do you live a godly life in the midst of an ungodly culture. And so this morning is not only going to be a message in and of itself, but it's kind of kind of set up what we're heading into over the coming weeks. He had this decision that he had to make, too, to stand strong in the face of compromise. So let's go to Daniel chapter 1, and I want to read you just the first couple of verses which are going to sort of set this up for us. Daniel chapter 1, I'm going to read you verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, 
Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, into, uh, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Now, this is really kind of like a dateline for the story, okay? Just like when you look in a newspaper, there's a dateline that says, you know, who wrote it, where was this, you know, when did it happen? And that's what this is. This sets the context for what we are reading here in the book of Daniel. Now, I'm going to throw up here on the screen here a timeline for you. Then this is going to show a little bit, just an idea of what we're looking at. Now, the Israelites had been disobedient to the Lord, and he had said again and again, you are going to be disciplined for this. And he had predicted through Jeremiah that there would be a 70-year exile. Well, that came in part in 605 B.C. And that is when the characters we're going to see today uh, were taken captive. All right, and so that's, that's what we're reading about right now. Now, last week we did Jeremiah chapter 29. You can see where his letter falls in this. This is after that first deportation um, at the time of the third deportation. So there's three waves of time. Excuse me, not the, yeah, that was the second, second deportation there. Um, so they, they came and took people away from Jerusalem at three different times. The people that we're going to see today, we're going to look at four of them. These are going to be our main characters through these first chapters of Daniel. These four guys were taken in that first siege of Babylon. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, keep reading here, uh, verses 3 through 5. <coughs> then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom there was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered them to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. That's the Babylonians. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter into the king's personal service. Now this is what you would call deprogramming deprogramming. They took these guys and they stripped them away from family, from home, from their, their, what they had learned, even from their language. They had to learn a different language, how to read and write in, in the Babylonian language. And they basically said, you are going to become Babylonian. You are no longer going to be Hebrew. You are going to become just like us. But they also took something else from these guys, and this one is not necessarily quite as evident right up front. Um, if you saw in verse 3, it's had the term officials there. Literally, that is the term eunuchs. So the chief of the eunuchs was ordered to take these guys. Now, a eunuch, in case you're not familiar with that term, is a, uh, a castrated male. Okay, A person who has been uh, surgically uh, modified so that they are not going to be a threat to the people that they are serving. A, a threat to the women, a threat to the men, anything like that. So they have been, uh, they have suffered that. Now, it stands to reason that if it's the chief of the eunuchs that was told to take these guys, probably these guys were made eunuchs as well. So the people that we're going to be learning about today not only had their culture and their language and their home and their family taken, but probably their masculinity was taken as well. These guys suffered greatly. It was all an effort to say, you are nothing. We have conquered you, and you are a nobody. We tell you who you are, and you will do what we tell you to do. You are here strictly in order to serve our purposes. You're a nobody. You're a commodity to be used up and thrown away. Now, let's meet our main characters. Verse 6. Now, among them, from the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And then the commander of the officials signed new names to them, and to Daniel, he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Now, taking these names from them was not only stripping them of their identity. We're not even going to call you by your name. We're going to give you a new name to show that you're, just a, you're a totally different person now. But they're also stripping their religion from them because each of these names is a reference to God. Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah Yahweh has acted graciously. Azariah means who is what God is. And Mishael, oh, excuse me, that was Mishael's name, I think, and Azariah's name is Yahweh has helped. So these guys' names even spoke of their religion, of their faith. And these Babylonian names that they give them were honoring the Babylonian gods. And so they have stripped everything 
from these guys. You change our, their, somebody's name, you change how they view themselves. You change other people's names, it changes how that person is viewed. And if you change even the words that we use, told them to use a different language here. You change that, you're going to change people's perception of reality. Now, we have seen that this kind of deprogramming is going on in our culture as well right now, right? As people are arguing over what different words mean, particularly in the, all of the, uh, the sexual revolution that is going on right now. See, this deprogramming isn't, isn't just ancient, and this reprogramming isn't just something that happened in a far-off land. It's happening here today. So, um, for instance, you have to be careful now uh, even going to the children's section of the library because in that children's section, I've seen books that are teaching about um, the LGBT revolution and uh, you know, teaching about homosexuality. In some of the school systems, they've actually, this was even 20 years ago, they would, had um, books in there that they, um, such as Heather has two mommies or daddy's roommate. It was tr trying to teach kids that it's okay to have two parents of the same sex. You know, indoctrinating kids in like kindergarten, first grade, and teaching them these sort of things. Um, I don't know if you've heard about this, that in some libraries, um, in some communities, that they have something called Drag Queen Story Hour, where they have drag queens come in, okay, which is basically a guy who's dressed up as a woman, acting like a woman, pretending to be a woman, coming in, read stories to the kids to help just show them, you know what, this is totally fine. This is totally okay. Um, I don't know if you've heard about this, that um, the House of Representatives has actually passed uh, rules now where you're not supposed to use gender-specific language. So you just refer to grandparents. It's not grandma and grandpa. You just refer to siblings. You don't use the term brother or sister because those, those are kind of narrowly putting people into a little niche and saying this is what you should be. Okay, it's, it's not mother or father, it's just parent. You have to use this gender neutral language. And in the military and in workplaces, now they're doing diversity training, which diversity training is great, you know, to help people understand there's diverse cultures and people. But what they're doing by this often is that they are trying to say, you know what, there is no difference between male and female and you get to choose which one that you are and you better make sure that you respect somebody else's choice. So you shouldn't call a person a man who's thinks he's a woman, you shouldn't use the term he or him. You got to be careful your pronouns or you could get in trouble. Now, lest you think that this is something that's just kind of far out and uh, not really on our radar, I want to tell you about a guy, uh, let's see here, by the name of Peter Vlaming. Now, Peter Vlaming was a, uh, a French teacher in a high school, and in his class was a transgender student. And it says that, uh, let's see here, I'll just kind of read this to you a little bit. Virginia teacher has filed lawsuits saying he was wrongfully fired for refusing to use male pro pronouns for a transgender student. So it was a female student who identified as male, and he did not use that, pro that proper pronoun. Uh, French teacher Peter Vlaming said that he couldn't in good conscience comply, citing his religious beliefs according to the complaint. He consistently used the student's preferred male name and attempted to avoid the use of pronouns at all, the lawsuit said. But as part of an exercise in the class, I don't know exactly what this was, uh, this student was supposed to walk, um, I guess, in a certain direction, and he said, uh, don't let her hit the wall. And because he used the wrong pronoun, he got in trouble for it. Um, Mr. Vlaming's conscience and religious practices prohibit him from intentionally lying. This is what his lawyer said. And he sincerely believes that referring to a female student as male by using an objectively male pronoun is telling a lie, the lawsuit argues. But they fired him for insubordination. He lost his job because of the fact that he was holding to his religious convictions and trying to do so in a respectful way. And I could read on about this uh, more and more, but there's a lawsuit that was uh, going on as a result of this. In our culture right now, we are, trying, we are being indoctrinated, deprogrammed and reprogrammed, so that we will not look at anything as a male-to-female distinction. That's, that's old, that's outdated, that's discriminatory. You're not allowed to do that anymore. So, just, so we understand that this is something that we face today, just the same way that Daniel did. Now, his was uh, completely involuntary because he was taken as a slave. Now, we still have free choice. 
you know, to be able to say, okay, we're going to go to this school, we're going to work in this location or not. He didn't even have um, that much of a choice. All of these things are efforts to deprogram us and to reprogram us. But Daniel makes a decision, and this is a decision to remain pure. All right? Let's look now at uh, verses 8 through 13. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander and the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days, and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating at the king's choice food. And deal with your servants according to what you see. Now, I want you to look again at Daniel verse, uh, verse 1. Excuse me, Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Daniel made up his mind. He made up his mind. He set a boundary and said, I will not cross this line. This far and no farther. I cannot eat this food. Now, we're not told exactly why uh, this food was defiled. It could be that it was um, pork or something that had been forbidden. You know, Jews had specific food they were allowed to eat and specific food they were to, not to eat. It could have been that. More likely, it is probably that this food was sacrificed to idols and then was brought to the table. And so Daniel and his friends realized, I can't be a participant in idol worship. This, this food is tainted by the fact that it is associated with these pagan gods. But whatever the reason, whether it was the kind of food or how it had been prepared and offered and such, he knew that to participate in this, to eat this food, would be to defile himself. This will make me unclean. This would be a sin for me to do this. And so he had the conviction to say, no, I can't cross this line. He had conviction before that crisis. It's an honorable commitment, but when you draw a line, you need to realize that there will be um, some challenges to that. When you say, here's the line, and I'm not going to cross it, what are some of those challenges? Well, first of all, he had to know that there was a, a cost, okay? He had to know the risk of this and count the cost ahead of time. If this commander might lose his head, what for Daniel and his friends? If they say, no, I won't eat this food, what could be the risk to them? Certainly they could be punished, maybe physically punished, maybe even executed for refusing to do this. But another thing that we have to remember when we draw a line is we need to make sure we cultivate credibility. Now, we're not told this specifically with, with him as to how it is that he was given favor, but he was given favor in the eyes of the commander. Now, if you think back to Joseph in the book of Genesis, when he was imprisoned in Egypt, we know that he was uh, given favor in the eyes of um, of Potiphar and then in the eyes of the jailer and he was a person that was so responsible and had such character that he was actually put in charge of the household of Potiphar he was put in charge of the jail to make sure that things were done properly for the other prisoners so how is it that you gain that credibility well through your integrity your kindness your consistency we don't know exactly what it was here but we know that Daniel had favor in the eyes of others so cultivate that credibility just through your consistent godly behavior. Third, use wisdom and tact. When you have to draw a line, use wisdom and tact in how you go about that. Now here, Daniel went to the commander and it says he sought permission. He sought permission to do things differently. And he also used a lot of tact. When he didn't make it anywhere with that commander, he went down the chain of command to his immediate supervisor, the overseer who was over Daniel and his friends. And so he used the chain of command and he went to people respectfully and said, here's what I propose. He didn't just throw his food. He didn't complain. He didn't, you know, uh, go on a hunger strike, anything like that. He went to them and he said, here's a proposal. This would be beneficial for us and for you. He sought a win-win in this and said, here's what I propose that we do. Let's just do this 10-day test. But then lastly, he accepted the consequences. He said, at the end of this 10 days, you look at us, and if, if we're no better than anybody else, then you make the call. You, you say what you want done. 
And so he left it up to them. He didn't try to usurp authority. He just sought to do the best that he could in the situation he was to maintain his integrity. There's another person that did this too. His name is Brendan Johnson. Now, he was a high school um, senior in Colorado. And Brendan was a wrestler. And he was a good wrestler as well. And so he was actually going to be going to state, to the state comp level competition as a wrestler. But he realized, in, as he was seeing the, um, the competition get whittled down, that two of the people that he was likely going to wrestle were going to be girls. Because they had inter you know, uh, co-ed wrestling there. They didn't have girls wrestling and guys wrestling, so they had to let the girls on the guys' teams to do the wrestling. And he said, because of his Christian convictions, he couldn't do that. I mean, wrestling is a high-contact sport. It is a violent sport. And he did not feel that as a Christian male that he could be treating women that way to wrestle them, both for the, the purity aspects as well as the violence aspect. He just did not feel that that was something he could do. So he forfeited his chance at a state title because of the fact that he was going to stick with his Christian convictions and say, no, I'm not going to do that. So he was respectful about it, but he drew a line and said, I can't cross it, and I'm willing to accept the consequences of not crossing that. And it cost him a shot at state. Now, I've cited some examples from the world of education, but it could be in the workplace, it could be in the neighborhood, it could be in your family, any number of places where you may have to draw a line and say, I know that this, I may be faced with this decision, but I'm going to decide ahead of time. When that time comes, that's my boundary. That's my line, and I am not crossing over that. I'll accept the consequences, but I'm going to hold to my convictions. Decide ahead of time. And then when you have purposed in your mind that's what you're going to do, practice your purpose. Practice your purpose. What do I mean with that? Okay, you guys remember from school, what was one of the things that you had to do every month, maybe every quarter? Fire drills, right? Okay, you had to do the fire drills. They'd sound the alarm. You would get up. You would walk out of the classroom, out of the building. You know, they had, of course, we're in the Midwest, so we had tornado drills as well that you had to do. So you had to go out in the hallway, had to kneel down, put your hands over your heads. All these people lined up along the, the wall. Why? Because when a tornado is bearing down and the sirens are wailing, when the smoke is pouring into the building, it is not the time to try and figure out what to do. You already know because you have practiced, practiced, practiced. You guys know what muscle memory is, right? Okay, where you do something so often that you don't have to think about it. How many of you have to focus on tying your shoes now, right? We don't have to. Now, when you're in you know, kindergarten, first grade, you learn to tie your shoes, it takes a lot of intentional effort, but you don't really have to do that now. You just naturally do it because your hands are so used to that. Same with riding a bike, driving a car. You don't have to put a lot of intentional effort into it because you've done it so much, your muscles are trained for it. When it comes to the decisions of integrity that we need to make, we need to have that conviction ahead of time. This is what I purpose to do and think through it. What am I going to do when a person offers me this? What am I going to do when I am challenged in this decision? What if the crowd is moving this way and I think I need to go that way? What am I going to do? Think through these situations. So basically, you're doing drills in your head. <coughs> you know, like a fire drill, tornado drill. I'm going to do it over and over again until the reaction is immediate. Now, this could be decisions of purity regarding a man and a woman and what sort of interactions you will have with somebody of the opposite sex. This could be decisions, <coughs> excuse me, I need to get a drink. This could be decisions that you would make regarding what you are going to allow into your bodies, okay, the, the food or the drink or, you know, drugs or whatever it is. It could be decisions as to what you will put before your eyes, the places that you will go, the activities you will be involved in. In the workplace, it could be deciding, you know what, I'm going to make sure that those numbers are accurate no matter what pressure I might have from a coworker or you're even a boss who says, I need you to adjust those numbers up or adjust those numbers down. I've been asked to do that before. I'm sure many of you have been asked to do that before too. You have to decide, how am I going to handle it? If my initials are going on that, if my name's going on that signature, if that thing's going out the door, I'm going to make sure that that is accurate and it has integrity. Have the conviction before the crisis and decide ahead of time and drill it into your head. Now, that commitment will be challenged, 
but our commitment will also be rewarded. It will also be rewarded. And what we see here is there is a divine blessing that comes to Daniel and his friends. Look at verses 14 to 17. So he, this is the overseer, listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine that they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. God blessed them. When they said, here's the line, I'm not crossing it, he blessed them on that side of the line. He made them, it says fatter, okay? They, they, they put on more weight, they were, looked better, they were smarter, they presented themselves better than any of the others. And so their overseer continued to withhold that food and that wine. I kind of wonder if that overseer ended up having to loosen his belt a couple notches because that food and wine had to go someplace, right? But they were able to maintain, they were rewarded with the opportunity to continue on in their purity. They were not pressured with this anymore. They made the decision and God blessed it. And he also blessed them, not just in their bodies and their minds, but also in their reputations and in their relationships so that when they went before the king, there was a positive result as well. Let's read on through verse 20. Then at the end of the days which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of them all, and this is all the young men who were being presented to him, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all of his realm. So they were rewarded. They were blessed. And you have to realize, though, that sometimes when you take a stand, that does not necessarily mean that you are going to have a good result. Sometimes it can be very costly when we choose to take a stand for the Lord. Now, I'm going to give you a few verses here from the New Testament. John chapter 15, verse 20. Jesus tells his disciples, Remember the word that I said to you, A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. And we know like through the book of Acts, Christians were persecuted over and over again. Some of them were killed for their faith and their integrity and for taking a stand uh, for the Lord. But I want to read you a few things here from uh, Timothy and from Peter. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 tells us that everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you choose to take a stand for integrity, if you choose to walk with the Lord, you're going to have people pushing back on it. You are going to suffer, and you are going to suffer loss. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be rewarded. You just may not be rewarded by people. You may not be rewarded now, but you will receive a reward at some point. And I want to read you a few verses here from 1 Peter. Now, I put them up in the NIV, so I'm going to actually turn here towards the screens to read them to you. 1 Peter 3.14 even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be frightened. But if, if in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Hold your convictions but do it in such a way that is compelling to others because you do it with gentleness and respect. You are firm but respectful at the same time and it will cause others to be ashamed because when they look at your integri the integrity of your walk and your kindness of character, they're going to realize we can't undermine that. We may not like what they're saying, but we can't undermine it because the person is being loud or mouthy or difficult. All right? So let's go to the next verse now. First uh, Peter 4.12 Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial that you're suffering as though something strange was happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And then he ends by saying, this is in verse 19, Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to their faithful creator, in doing what is right. We know that a time is coming when God's going to settle it all out, and we are going to be rewarded for our integrity, for our faithfulness, 
even when it has been costly. Walt, well, you can prepare to lead us in our closing song. So I want to close with a challenge. The challenge is twofold. It's those two challenges that we talked about earlier. One is to decide, and one is to drill. One is to decide, and one is to drill. Decide ahead of time what you are going to do. Think through the situations that you are going to face. Now, many of us, as we're talking through this, I'm sure you've had flashbacks to times when you have been challenged. These are times when you've been tempted to take a shortcut, to fudge things a little bit, to just go with the crowd. Think through those situations because they may come up again. I'm thinking particularly of my kids in school. They're going to be challenged over and over again. Are you going to stand or are you going to compromise? Then once you have made that decision, I am going to stand, drill, drill, drill. Think through, what am I going to say when this person comes to me? When this situation is presented to me, how am I going to respond? So that way we are ready to walk before the Lord in integrity. So take this closing song as a time to make that first step, not the drill step, but the decision step, and decide, Lord, I am going to stick with you no matter what. I'm going to draw that line, and I'm not going to cross it.